Notebook 13 The Psalm Offensive From the 29th of August, 1916, to the 1st of November, 1916 Part 2 On the last episode, we saw how Barthas and the rest of the Palus of the 296th Regiment were sent into the raging battle of the Somme. After an exhausting journey and two days without food or drink, Barthas's gun team finally found themselves in a trench near the commandant's dugout, waiting for them to be assigned to the front lines. We shall now see what happened there. During their stay in those trenches, every day at nightfall, two men from the team had to go out to bring back supplies, which included food, drink, letters, packages, and the occasional bag of ammunition. The regiment's truck drivers would help them in bringing the rations every second night so that the Palouse could rest, but still the work was very difficult, with the total trip being 25 kilometers in dark, moonless nights over a labyrinth of paths and roads in poor state, with the ever-present danger of German shelling. While those two men went to look for rations, the rest of the team had to stay in the flooded trenches with no shelter to speak of, their feet submerged under cold water and having to endure frequent rainstorms. Another, and arguably the worst feature of staying in that trench, was the constant and heavy German bombardments. The Germans occasionally bombarded the rear positions, but they sent the vast majority of their shells into the first and second trench lines, making life very difficult. Still, for every shell the Germans fired, the Allied artillery fired four. The intensity of these constant bombardments was such that the Germans only kept a screen of sharpshooters and machine gunners at the front line, spread out over large shell holes and small pits with enough food and ammunition for their entire stay there, so that they practically never left their holes. Barthas commented on how in this war fighting meant little more than being a target for shells, and so the best commander was not the one that knew the best tactics, but the one that knew best how to preserve the lives of his men. And on this he wrote that the Allied leaders could have learned much from the German ones, who, even though they were not more humane, had the intelligence to try and carefully preserve their manpower. One particular night in the trench, Barthas was preparing to sleep when the company sergeant major suddenly appeared. He gave Barthas a message and told him to immediately head out and deliver it to Sub-Lieutenant Loriu, who was commanding another 37 millimeter cannon team. So Barthas had to head out to try and find Loriu. There had been such urgency to the sergeant major's commands that Barthas thought the message must be extremely important, in all likelihood an order for an attack. When he was alone, he peeked into the message and was shocked to discover what it was. An order asking all unit commanders, including the sub-lieutenant, to report how many units of a particular model of gas mask were being used by their men. Barthas was angered. There were several gas masks of different models in use throughout the army, and, due to some higher up wishing to immediately know the numbers of this particular model and not being willing to wait a day, Barthas was being ordered out into the night to brave the German shells and the roads that had been turned into swamps, to try and find the sub-lieutenant. The risk of dying was very real, and it was all for such a trivial task. The sergeant major had assured Barthas that the sub-lieutenant would be in a bunker near the railway station of Comble. As Barthas approached, he could see that the town was being bombarded by the Germans. One would hear the terrible shrieks of the shells falling, and moments later there would be blinding flashes as enormous explosions shattered what rubble and walls they found. Together with this, 
two ammunition dumps had just exploded, and so the town was a sinister spectacle of smoke and flames. There was no one to be seen. Risking being court-martialed for not following orders, Bartha started retreating towards the town of Hardeku. But he soon ran into two engineers who told him that the sub-lieutenant, like everyone else, was probably hiding in what they called the catacombs. The engineers explained that one had only to follow a particular road into the center of town, and from there one would easily spot the ruins of a chateau. That was where the catacombs were located. Martha soon found the road which the engineers had mentioned, now little more than a trail of mud, split into dozens of different trails by all the rubble. As he followed the road, the bombardment on the town grew in intensity. At every moment, Barthas would hear the sinister shriek of shells and flatten himself against what piece of broken cover he could find, instants before being showered by pebbles, iron and dirt. At one moment, he fell into despair of ever getting out alive from this place. As he leaned against a wall with the bombardment all around him, he thought how this would be just as good a place to die as anywhere else. But at that moment, a thought flashed into his mind, that of his family, his wife, his children, his parents, all praying for his safety. Barthas wrote that he did not believe prayers could deflect bullets and shells, but the sudden image of his loved ones gave him the strength to not give up and try to survive. He broke into a run through the bombed-out ruins and soon found a road with a sad sight. In the middle of it there lay a burning ambulance. By its light, Barthas could see nearby a shattered field kitchen which had come too close to the town. Its two horses lay dying and moaning on the ground and nearby were the corpses of two men in a puddle of blood, wine, and coffee. One man had been decapitated, the other was missing his leg, and probably had other wounds that could not be distinguished in the darkness. Barthas thought how that night, a company in the trenches would find itself without rations, but the man would not offer a word of complaint when they heard why it was so. As he beheld the sad scene, a squad of territorials suddenly appeared. With picks and shovels they came at the first pause in the bombardments to clear and repair the roads. This was a vital task, as through their food and shells were sent to the front lines, while the wounded were evacuated through it. It was not rare for the German shells to claim the territorials' blood during their task. The roads were lined with little crosses that attested to this fact. Barthas wrote that seeing the territorials felt like seeing a caravan appear in the middle of the desert. He approached them and asked where he could find the catacombs. The territorials explained that they had just exited them. They were but a few steps away. Barthas approached the pile of rubble indicated by the territorials, and soon found an opening that led into a deep and long underground passageway. As he followed its gentle downward slope, he found himself entering what was like an ant nest. To his left and right he could see chambers that served all kinds of purposes. Offices, telephone centers, first aid stations, dormitories, storage rooms for gas masks, weapons, tools, and all other kinds of material. There were people coming and going in all directions. The place buzzed with activity. Barthas asked for Lorieu, but no one had seen an officer from the 296th Regiment. Eventually, exhausted, Barthas decided to wait for daybreak and stretched over a pile of gas masks that belonged to wounded that had been evacuated. The masks were covered in mud and blood. But Barthas was too tired to care, and no one interrupted him. As he lay on the bloody gas masks, he wondered who had built this large underground complex. Had it been the Germans? Had it been built before the war? 
none he asked knew the answer, and so he fell asleep. At dawn, he went to the railway station to try and find Sublieutenant Lorieux to deliver the message. But it was all in vain, and in the end he returned to his comrades in the trenches empty-handed. The query for the gas masks unresolved. During the next evenings, the gun crews found it difficult to sleep as the rationers did not return. With what Barthas had seen on the road, it became clear what had happened, and so they had to wait, though at least they were assured that things would be resolved as soon as possible. During those days, Barthas visited the field kitchens of his old companies, the 13th and 15th, and asked them for news. All the soldiers were suffering with the freezing rain and the constant shelling. Every day there were dead and wounded, so was war. Later, Barthas wrote that the 23rd of October of 1916 was a special day for the 296th Regiment. The previous night they had received orders to attack and take the German first line, and so the men spent the hours of darkness digging saps to get closer to the German trench and shorten the distance they would have to cover on open ground during the assault. Martha's own 4th Battalion discovered that they had pushed the sap too close to the Germans, and so had to be extremely careful not to alert them with the noise of their work. When dawn broke and the fog lifted, the Germans were shocked to find the French a few steps away from them, and, not willing to die in this war they had been forced to fight, they immediately raised their arms, surrendering while shouting, Comrades! Comrades! Some of the Germans were absolutely terrified by the Poilus, and, taking advantage of the chaos and what was left of the fog, fled. Still, the battalion ended up capturing 52 men. Barthas wrote that, during that day's assault, there were various noteworthy incidents. In the 14th Company, Lieutenant Cordier, who was well liked by the soldiers, led the attack in front of his men and was the first one to jump into the German trench. He saw a tent cloth that was covering a dugout and threw it to the side. Inside, there was a sleeping German adjutant who fell off his bed. In the confusion, as the lieutenant called him to surrender, the German pulled out his pistol and fired, hitting Cordier several times. Still, the good lieutenant captured the German and forbid anyone from harming him. On another part of the trench, one of the Poilus found a German who, despite great efforts, couldn't get out of his hole. The Poilu extended a hand to help and said, Come on, climb out, lazy bones. To his surprise, the German answered him in French, I am not a lazy bones. You are a Frenchman and I am a German. At another part of the trench, the police found the corpse of a German officer, with his head bashed in and a bloody German shovel nearby. It was clear that the officer had not wished to surrender, and so his men had dispatched him. Another living haughty and furious German officer was brought to the commandant. When he stood before the commandant, the officer did not move. Lieutenant Guillot of the 13th Company asked the German to salute the commandant. The man did not move. Again the lieutenant asked, and again the disrespectful German refused to move. So Guillot gave him a hard slap on both cheeks. The German officer went pale, then red, and finally saluted. Meanwhile, the regiment's 6th battalion attacked at the same time as the 4th, but met heavy machine gun fire and the men had to take cover in shell holes. They took considerable casualties and had to be relieved that same evening by the 5th battalion. Later, on the 25th of October, Martha's own battalion was relieved and sent to the rear for rest. But a last-minute counter-order put Barthes's 37mm gun team at the disposal of the 5th Battalion. That same evening, 
It was Barthes's turn to go get food for his gun team, together with their truck driver Casté, and a two-man ration team from one of the 5th Battalion's guns. The two men of that ration team were called Soumazou and Fraze. Barthes wrote how Fraze was born at the town of Olonza, in southern France, a town famous for its good wine. Fraze was a plump, rosy-cheeked man. With a healthy appetite and humor, he was always an optimist, emanating joy from every pore of his being, with a double and even triple chin on his peaceful face. He always looked at the good side of things and had a joke for any situation. The only thing that could seriously disturb him was any possibility of a day off fast, even on holy days. After getting the food, the four Poilus had to go to a place called the Circe Trench. Soumazou and Fraze had already been there before, but as they left behind the colonel's command post and entered the battered plain with the darkness of the night and many crisscrossing paths, they got lost and were not sure where to go. Luckily, the group met two messengers who were also heading to the front line. The messengers were happy to serve as guides in exchange for some of the food they were carrying, and so they departed. But the going was difficult. Constantly and all over the plain the Germans were unleashing violent bombardments. The messengers only carried their papers, but Barthes and his three companions were overloaded with canteens and bags. Fraze in particular was loaded like a mule, and his protruding belly messed with his balance. He was constantly tripping and falling into shell holes, requiring the others to help him back up. Barthes wrote that it would have been funny if not for the dangerous bombardment falling all around them. The anxious messengers urged them on. The land was completely devastated with not a single tree or patch of vegetation left. The only point of reference was a lonely telephone pole that was either being supported by or supported to other poles and which was occasionally outlined by the light of an explosion or flare. As they advanced, suddenly they heard the loud whistling of shells right above them, and everybody dropped into a shell hole. There were huge explosions nearby, but no one was harmed. Come on, hurry, said the two guides, but immediately a second volley came and everyone took cover. Again there were huge explosions and miraculously no one was harmed. The worried messengers picked up the pace. Barthes wrote that he thanked Providence for having blessed him with long legs, with which he could keep up with the messengers. But he soon heard the pleads from his lagging companions to please wait for them. Barthes begged the two guides to wait a moment for the other three. The worried guides acquiesced, though complained as shells fell around them. Finally, they were all together and the guides explained. We are two hundred meters away from the Circe Trench. We have to reach it in one bound. Everyone ready? Let's go! As if this had been a sign, the German artillery unleashed a monstrous barrage. Desperately, the Poilus ran through the mud, water, and shell holes with explosions going off all around them, and metal fragments and pieces of dirt flying everywhere. It was terrifying and those two hundred meters felt eternal. Finally, they reached the Circe Trench and practically fell into it. The trench was pockmarked with small holes inhabited by the trenches dwellers. Barthes breathed a sigh of relief, but soon realized his three companions were missing and went out to look for them. He found Casté half dead with terror. The man had fallen behind due to staying too long in a particular shell hole. And he also found the happy Fraze, completely covered in mud and capering about the trench like a clown. Fortunately, the two men did not have a mark on them, but the third man, Sumazu, was nowhere to be seen. Sumazu was nearsighted by day and practically blind by night, and no matter how much they searched and called out to him, after the bombardment had passed, he did not appear. They were worried that he might have been hit, and furthermore, Barthes was annoyed, as due being the corporal, 
he could be held responsible for Sumazu's disappearance. Eventually, the three of them had to give up the search for the time being, as they had to deliver the rations to their fellow comrades from the canteens. One part of the Circe Trench was at the edge of what was called the Morval Forest, a place that was constantly bombarded. Here there was a mass of half-demolished trenches and a few deep and solid shelters that had previously belonged to the Germans. The Germans knew exactly where these shelters were located, and so shells fell right on them day and night non-stop, and they were slowly crumbling away. They were too dangerous for the commandant, and so they had become the home for couriers and signalmen, together with the 37mm gun teams, who were useless in darkness and so braved the path to these shelters. Five minutes of danger for a night of safety. In the deep darkness and the railer and broken terrain, it took Barthas and his two companions over an hour to finally find in what shelter their comrades were hiding, and finally give them their rations. At last, Barthas's gun crew was relieved, and they left at 3 a.m. that same night. As he guided the team, Barthas's only landmarks consisted of the three telephone poles and a single dead body but no one got lost and there were no noteworthy incidents, though the going was not easy as they had to hold their heavy cannon and its shells. They eventually reached the town of Hardecou. Still, Thumazu was nowhere to be seen, which added to everyone's worry. Barthas wrote that they did not know how Thumazu, who came from Auvergne in central France, had ended up in a southern regiment. Still, the man had enjoyed their company, and had always admired the lively expressions, jokes, curses, and spirit of the southern soldiers. And, due to his being a cabinet maker, the Paloos had nicknamed him Pastepot. Finally, in the afternoon, they saw Thumazu appear in the town. The poor man was barely recognizable, completely exhausted and covered in mud and clay. After he recovered enough strength to speak, all the Paloos were eager to hear his story, the comrades of his gun squad more than most, as he had been the one that was carrying their wine and coffee rations, and with his disappearance the men had had to quench their thirst with filthy water from a shell hole. Thumazu explained that just as they had been getting close to the Circe trench, and under the strong bombardment, Fraze had tripped into the ground. Sumazu approached to try and help him, but then he also stumbled and fell into a huge crater. He cried out with all his strength, but it seemed that Fraze could not hear him. As Sumazu climbed out of the crater, he found himself completely alone with explosions going off all around him. He ran off like a madman and got lost. Then he spent the night wandering through the deserted woods and ruins of Morval until finally at daylight he found some shelters occupied by territorials, who helped him make his way back to Hardaku. That same night there was another unlucky incident, as Barthas and his gun team discovered that someone had taken the big iron wheels of their 37mm gun right off its axle. Barthas wrote that if one listened to the soldiers then there existed no thieves in Hardaku nor did there exist anyone who had been sent there to kill or die. Still, it was clear that it must have been the crew of some other 37mm gun crew that had probably lost its own wheels in the muddy lands, and had made do with their wheels. Barthas and his comrades grew very anxious. If the theft was discovered by the higher-ups, they could be punished severely and sent back to their companies for losing the wheels of their cannon. The victims would be punished instead of the thieves, and so they worried greatly. The German bombardments in the area paused, and Barthas wrote that in the next few days the camp at Hardecou expanded massively with an influx of all kinds of people from all the corners of the world. French, British, Australians, Canadians, Hindus, black-skinned, yellow-skinned and red-skinned, 
It was like an exodus of all the peoples of the world in this land of war. Amid this mix of colors and languages of all kinds, and increasingly desperate, Barthas, together with the rest of his team, scoured everywhere for a spare for their cannon. He wrote that if they found one, they would have snatched it without the slightest scruple. But in this multicultural camp there was everything except a pair of wheels for a French 37. They were resigning themselves to whatever harsh punishments they would be dealt, when, one night, they were woken up by the rationers of a frontline gun, who told them of something miraculous. At the side of the road to town there was a trailer with a pair of wheels for a 37 millimeter cannon. Yes, the wheels were well tied to the trailer, and it seemed that the trailer's driver was sleeping underneath it with one eye open. But this did not discourage Barthas and his three comrades. He wrote that it made him blush in shame to admit this, but the four of them armed themselves with a saw and a hatchet to cut the rope that held the wheels, and with a towel and some extra rope to tie up and gag the driver if he tried to stop them. Then, at midnight, they departed and soon spotted the trailer and the blessed wheels. They looked around. No one was nearby. They climbed onto the trailer and in less than two minutes cut the rope with a saw and ran away, carrying the wheels as happy as a gang of thieves with gold. And Barthas emphasized that before this, in all likelihood, none of them had ever stolen a cherry. War was a great moralizer, and so they avoided punishment for losing their cannon wheels. Time passed. One day, Barthas was suddenly greeted by Victor Grandjean, a young Parisian orphan from Barthas's former squad of delinquents, and whom Barthas liked very much. Grandjean had been in relief nearby, and so he had come to visit him. The young Parisian gave Barthas sad news. The young Breton, Maurice Yves, who before they entered the trenches had given Barthas back two francs he had borrowed from him, the kid who had always liked to show off a picture of his pretty girlfriend, was dead. He had been resting in a hole with a comrade and the squad's new corporal when a huge shell arrived and blew them to pieces. Barthas's friend, Paul Alpech, who had continued his duty in the squad as a rationer, had been in that hole moments before, when he was called to pick up supplies. Yves immediately took Alpech's place in the hole, and two minutes later the shell fell. Such was the terrible influence of luck on life and death in war. Granja further told Barthas of how terrible the conditions were at their trenches, with the constant rain turning the place into a sewer, and the freezing cold which acted cruelly on their damp feet. In Barthas's old squad, four of the youngsters, Delatre, Maurice Joy, Peyron and Flamand had to be evacuated due to frozen feet. Despite all these losses, again on the 31st of October, their battalion received orders to head back to the front line that very night. Barthes and his gun team were preparing their mule, an animal called Fale, to haul their cannon and ammo when they were interrupted by the Marshal of Dragoons, who commanded the cavalry detachment. The marshal declared that the road was too dangerous for the mules, and they would have to carry their things on foot. Mules were becoming more and more difficult to find, while there were plenty of men. But Barthas and his comrades were not discouraged. In the darkness at the hour of their departure, the team silently approached and untied Fale, who was kept in the open under the supposed watch of a stable guard was too busy resting in a comfortable nook made in a pile of harnesses and horse collars, and so the was left for the front lines with Fale, the mule. Everything was going well, until at one point Fale suddenly stopped and wouldn't budge despite their best efforts. It seemed the stubborn and intelligent beast sensed danger ahead. He was not mistaken as farther ahead the road was being shelled at several spots that had to be crossed at a run. As they tried to move the stubborn animal, 
a shell suddenly fell on the road 200 meters ahead of them, right in the middle of a column of territorials that were on their way to work. When the police passed through that spot, they saw the survivors of the group dealing with 12 heavily wounded men and at least 8 dead. After this explosion, Fale understood that he had to pick up the pace, and the police actually had difficulties keeping up with him. Eventually, after passing through the town of Comble, the road stopped, and the police had to leave the mule behind and carry their things on their own all the way to the trenches. That same night, the French and English artilleries unleashed a bombardment that was even more violent than usual. The air was filled with the shrieks of shells and vibrated with young counted explosions. So many guns were firing that all one could hear was an uninterrupted roar. Despite being used to bombardments, the police felt a pressure on their chests and felt as if their heads were going to burst. Dazed, they stumbled everywhere. And so, as the police arrived at the trenches, the orders were passed down. The officers had kept the secret until the very last moment. The Corps would attack the German lines the next day. But we shall have to see what happened with that on the next episode. For now, we've reached the end of the 13th notebook. With the constant violence and misery of the Somme, its strange sights, and the promises of new attacks. For now, I hope you all have a good day, and I'll see you next time.